Hi, I'm Reverend David Clark, and I want to welcome you to Melbourne Baptist Church Online. Uh, if you uh, are new to us, then I'd urge you to visit our website, www.melbournebaptistchurch.org.uk, where you can get more information about how you can connect with us online. Also, later on in our service, we will be sharing communion together. So if you need to pause the video and go and uh, get some bread and wine, then you can do so now. Let's uh, begin by singing our first song, See What a Morning. New Testament reading this morning is taken from Colossians chapter 1, starting to read at verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of your evil behaviour, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you have heard 
and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Let's sing a song uh, which celebrates the creation and the way in which the creation brings glory to God. Creation sings the Father's song. Creation sings the Father's song. He calls the sun to wake the dawn and run the course of day till evening falls in crimson freedom. His fingerprints in flakes of snow. Upon the spinning glow, he charts the eagle's flight, commands the newborn baby's cry. Alleluia! Let all creation stand and sing. Alleluia! Fill the earth with songs of worship. Tell the wonders of
Let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning is taken from Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 2 to 9 and verses 29 to 32. What do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. For everyone belongs to me. The parent as well as the child, both alike, belong to me. The one who sins is the one who will die. Suppose there is a righteous man who does what is just and right. He does not eat at the mountain shrines or look to the idols of Israel. He does not defile his neighbour's wife or have sexual relations with a woman during her period. He does not oppress anyone, but returns what he took in pledge for a loan. He does not commit a robbery, but give his food to the hungry and provides clothing for the naked. He does not lend to them at interest or take a profit from them. He withholds his hand from doing wrong and judges fairly between two parties. He follows my decrees and faithfully keeps my laws. That man is righteous. He will surely live, declares the Sovereign Lord. And then on to verse 29. Yet the Israelites say, the way of the Lord is not just. Are my ways unjust, people of Israel? Is it not your ways that are unjust? Therefore, you Israelites, I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent, turn away from all your offences, then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all the offences you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, people of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent and live. Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray and make your word live in our hearts this morning. Help me, Lord, as I speak it, to accurately reflect your heart to your people. Amen. One of the spectator sports of lockdown is watching Donald Trump talk rubbish. It would be really funny if the context was not so tragic. We're going to be open relatively soon. I would love to have the country opened up and just raring to go by Easter. Or is there a way we could inject people with disinfectant? We could use tremendous ultraviolet light or just very powerful light on or even inside the body. What makes these statements worse is that he consistently accuses uh, others who try to hold him to account of spreading fake news. And in chapter 13 of Ezekiel, we have a similar conflict between Ezekiel, God's prophet, and the prophets in Jerusalem. God comes to Ezekiel and says, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who are now prophesying. Say to those who prophesy out of their own imagination, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says, woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. God is angry with these prophets because they lead my people astray saying peace when there is no peace and because when a flimsy wall is built they cover it with whitewash. You see at this time Jerusalem is threatened by a vastly superior enemy the Babylonians and is about to be besieged and then destroyed. The walls of Jerusalem will be little defence but the false prophets are essentially building whitewashed walls of false hopes and wishful thinking, 
claiming that because Jerusalem is the capital of God's chosen nation and the symbolic dwelling place uh, of God's glory is the temple of its heart, then Jerusalem is secure, which is what the people want to hear. And in former times, this would have been a commendable step of faith and obedience. God had defended his people against superior odds many times before in their history, telling them to only stand and see the deliverance of their God. But now, because of her sin, God had given over Israel, and I include Judah in that, into the hands of the Babylonian invaders as a disciplinary judgment. The false prophets who are in the majority are simply not listening to God, but prophesying out of their own imagination what the people want to hear. And this is dangerous. In a similar manner, God tells Ezekiel to speak against the prophetesses of Jerusalem in chapter 13. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to the women who sew magic charms on all their wrists in order to ensnare people. Will you ensnare the lives of my people and preserve your own? You have profaned me against my people for a few handfuls of barley and scraps of bread. By lying to my people who listen to lies, you have killed those who should not have died and have spared those who should not live. You see, they were fortune telling for money, even perhaps casting magic spells against people. Now, a bit voodoo-like, to curse people with death. So this raises for us, I think, questions about where we put our security. Do we put our security in science? I praise God for good science. It's brought amazing benefits to our lives. Many of us would not be alive today if it were not for science. We shouldn't put all our trust in science. The government says that it's following the scientific evidence in the COVID-19 crisis. But even scientists disagree. But it's better to follow the science than to follow the quasi-science. Like the stuff going around that coronavirus cause is caused by 5G phone masks. And people are actually going out and vandalising them. I remember uh, when I was at school in the sixth form, uh, a lot of my friends were reading um, books by Eric von Däniken. You may have read Chariot of the Gods, in which he presented evidence of alien landings. Now, it turned out, in the end, he wasn't a professor at all, but he owned a small hotel in Switzerland. But in recent years, we've had an explosion of New Age teachings and other quasi-science. Or you could even trust in superstition. I think most of you listening are mature enough to reject lucky charms and the occult and magic, but there can still be Christian versions of superstition. Things like St Christopher pendants, believing if you wear a St Christopher you're somehow protected on your journeys. Or believing that we're automatically protected from coronavirus because we're Christians and we're under the blood. And therefore we don't need to take precautions. I mean, this is a tricky one. I do believe that it's right to pray to God for protection. And that God hears our prayers. But unless we hear very clearly from God, I don't believe we're immune from COVID-19 or any disease. And even then we should obey proper precautions, if not for the example it shows to others. Now look at the case of the South Korean church who ignored advice and ended up being a virus hotspot. So where do we put our security? Yes, we follow the best medical advice and we follow the social distancing guidelines. But we put our ultimate security in God. Psalm 91 says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom we trust. 
And even if we die, we know that death is not the end for those who trust in Jesus. As Paul said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Have you noticed that you're not allowed to have an accident nowadays? It's always got to be someone's fault. There must be someone to sue. The people of Israel are unhappy about their situation in this reading, either in exile or facing the destruction of their city. And we're quoting a proverb of the time, the parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. They're essentially blaming the failings of the previous generations for their predicament. And they did have some justification for it. God had continually sent prophets, of which Ezekiel was the latest, to warn Israel to turn from her wicked ways over hundreds of years, or she would come under God's judgment. Indeed, that is what God has said elsewhere. For example, in the second of the Ten Commandments from Exodus 20, you shall not bow down to images or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But now God is saying to Israel, this proverb is no longer true. The one who sins is the one who will die. The responsibility is, is yours, not your forefathers. So is God contradicting himself? Or has God changed his mind? Now it's true that the reason God allowed Israel to go into exile was because of the consistent sin of rebellious Israel over centuries. But it's also the responsibility of the current generation who have walked in the way of their forebears. What God is saying to Israel is that your forebears may have sinned, but it's no use blaming them. You're the ones who have to take responsibility for your own sin, and I will hold you accountable for your own sin. Also, you're the ones who have to make changes in your life if you want the situation to change, because your forebears can't make those changes for you because they're dead. Some of the Israelites were also blaming God for their predicament. Yet the Israelites say, the way of the Lord is not just. And God responds, are my ways unjust, people of Israel? Is it not your ways that are unjust? Therefore, you Israelites, I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the Sovereign Lord. We can blame all sorts of people for the problems we face in life. For example, we can blame others for the Covid crisis. We can blame the Chinese for their appalling animal markets. We can blame the government for their slow response. We can blame big business for globalisation. We can blame the people who owe barbecues and raves when they should be social distancing. We can blame God for creating viruses in the first place. And I think Establishing cause and effect is important for the control of the current epidemic and the prevention of another. But blaming others won't help us. We have to acknowledge our responsibilities too. We voted for the government and their predecessors and their lower taxes. We went along with the globalisation and the cheap goods that it supplied. We must accept our part in environmental damage and we have to accept our responsibility to change our ways. In wider life we can blame others for our problems too. We can blame our parents, we can blame our genes, we can blame our lack of life choices, we can blame God. Now I do think there is such a thing as generational cursing, to use some evangelical jargon where the sins of the forebears have spiritual and other effects upon subsequent generations. And identifying the root of these is important. But it's no use just leaving it there. 
Shifting blame is not enough. We are the ones who need to take spiritual responsibility under God if we want to see our situations change. In this church, uh, we have a course called Freedom in Christ, which explores this in detail. And I've seen how poor parenting, abuse, occult activity by family members or significant figures in our past have often messed up people's lives. But the key to getting out of the mess that people are in is to understand who they are in Christ and to take responsibility for their spiritual lives and allow the power of Jesus Christ to set them free. And it really does work. Jesus came and said, I have come to give you life and life in, in all its fullness. And he says, if the sun shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. You can be free from your past in Christ. God then gives an outline of the kind of righteous life he wants his people to live in verses 5 to 9. And it's drawn from sections of the Old Testament law, including the Ten Commandments. And I think these apply just as much to us today as they did in Ezekiel's day. Verse 6 says, don't trust in idols. And we can have our own idols, can't we? Possessions, money, career, anything that displaces God in our affections. Verse 6, don't commit adultery. We should treat women with respect. We should live holy lives. And witness the rise of the Me Too movement. And I think things are changing, but they could change a lot more. Verse 7, don't oppress people, especially financially. Instead, show generosity to the poor and needy. And this kind of generosity is needed during lockdown due to the financial pressures upon people. We as a church have a church fellowship fund to which you can contribute to help others in the fellowship who may be in need. And it's been encouraging to see there has been, I think, a rise in kindness across our communities. And we should also apply Christian ethics to our investment and shopping decisions. Now, pension funds often have ethical options and we can explore those. We should shop fair trade and sustainably if we can. In verse 8, we should act justly and not without, not with prejudice. And generally, we should keep God's laws. And finally, God says through Ezekiel, there is good news. Verse 21. But if a wicked person turns away from all their sins and does what is right and just, that person will surely live and they will not die. None of the offences they have committed will be remembered against them. And in this passage, we start to get a hint of the divine power that there is available to help the repentant sinner to live a righteous life. Rid yourselves of all the offences you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, people of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Sovereign Lord, repent and live. Now we'll be looking at this further in our studies in Ezekiel in future weeks. But in Jesus Christ we have a Saviour who died for us in order that God in his grace and mercy might forgive us all our sins. Hallelujah! And as Christians we need to realise the divine resources we have in the Holy Spirit to enable us to live a holy life that we're called to live. You see, what makes Christianity different from other world religions and philosophies is that we have God's Spirit inside us. Most of these other philosophies and religions say, do what is right, keep these disciplines, be a better person. But Christianity's founder, Jesus, says, I will be with you and I will send my spirit 
into your lives to help you. Jesus doesn't leave us on our own to make the best fist of it. He says, I will come and live my life in you. I will give you my power to change and make a difference. And if you want to know how you can know that power for yourself, ask Jesus Christ into your life to be your saviour. Put your trust in him. And Jesus will come into your life and change you. He will give you a new heart and a new spirit. Let's pray. Father God, help us to take responsibility for our own lives. Help us to take responsibility for our own sin, to turn from our ways and to walk in your ways. And we thank you that we have your resources. We, can, we thank you that we can have your spirit in our lives if we trust completely in you. Amen. Let's just sing uh, our next song, Jesus, Jesus, Holy and Anointed One. come to the Lord's Supper and we invite all those who know and love the Lord as their personal saviour to share with us in this meal. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He also said, listen, I'm standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, 
I will come into you and eat with you and you with me. Paul says, in Romans, God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Jesus said, come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Come to this table, not because you must, but because you may. Not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because of any goodness of your own, that gives you a right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. Come because he loved you and gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. We pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And so remember how on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he gave him thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this whenever you eat it to remember me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, This is the blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it to remember me. Let us drink together and remember Jesus' blood who was shed for us upon the cross. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gates of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who share his cup bring life to others. We in the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope that you have set before us. So we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray together. Your death, O Lord, we commemorate. Your resurrection we confess. Your final coming we await. Glory be to you, O Lord. And let us say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And we'll sing our final song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, my blessed Redeemer. At the end of that song there will be an extra section for those who wish to know what it is to follow Jesus and there'll be an opportunity for you to pray and ask Jesus to come into your life. So if that's you, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Saviour, I would urge you to watch that section and consider praying along uh, with me to ask Jesus into your life. Good morning.
Come to the point of committing your life to Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, I'd like to give you the opportunity now. The Bible says in John 3 verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You see, God created a perfect world, but through our rebellion against him as a human race, Sin and death entered God's world. Because each one of us have sinned. In Romans 3 it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we deserve the punishment due as a result of that. Again in Romans 6 it says, The wages of sin is death. In his plan to save us, God sent his son Jesus into the world to live as one of us, to share our humanity and then to die upon the cross for our salvation. It says in the Bible that when Jesus died, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. The curtain separated the holy place from the most holy place, where the presence of God dwelt in his glory. And that symbolised that the barrier was removed between ourselves and God. The barrier being our sin. See, not only did the righteous man Jesus die in our place, he took our sin to the cross. Incredibly, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Christ we might become the righteousness of God. But the death of Jesus on the cross was not the end. Jesus rose again from the dead three days later. And the great news is that if we believe in Jesus and commit our lives to following in his footsteps, we too can live a new life. We can be born again into a new spiritual life now and a new resurrection life after death. The good news is that you can receive that offer of eternal life today. John 1 says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. And this eternal life is free. You don't have to earn it. You can't earn it. This is a work of God's amazing grace. Paul says in Ephesians, for it's by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. For those who have never made that step of commitment to follow Jesus, I give you the opportunity to do so now. Pray this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that I have sinned against you. I believe that you have died on the cross to take away my sin. I believe that you rose again from the dead. And with you I can rise to eternal life too. I receive you as Lord and Saviour of my life from this day forward. Amen. If you prayed that prayer sincerely, I believe that God has enabled you to be born again as a child of his. And I'd urge you to go to our website, www.malvernbaptistchurch.org.uk and see the contact section and let me know so that I can send you more information about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And when this lockdown is finished, then do come and visit us uh, on Abbey Road, Melbourne Baptist Church, Abbey Road. We would love to see you. Good morning.